Hi there, my name's Simon from Cram the Exam, and welcome to this week 6, day 5 of your 12-week preparation course to get you ready for your English exam, whether it's the FCE, CAE, or Matura Advanced. Last week on Friday we had a little break from the speaking exam, but this week we're back into it, and today I'd like to critically assess part one and part two of the FCE and CAE speaking exam using the fantastic videos put onto YouTube onto YouTube, sorry, by Cambridge. You'll find the links to the videos in the video description below, and more importantly, in the video descriptions of the videos that I link to, in other words, the Cambridge videos, you'll find uh, the assessor's comments and, um, and suggestions as well, which are really, really important, and I would strongly recommend that you take some time to have a look at those to see what the examiners actually thought who are examining the people that we're going to have a look at in the next couple of videos. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at the part one um, question first for the FCE and CAE, then the part two question for the FCE and CAE. Uh, of course, as you'll, if you'll remember my video on parts one and parts two um, a few weeks ago, you'll know the differences between the FCE and CAE. So if you don't, be sure to check out those videos. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you how I would, uh, the comments I would have as if I was preparing those students and the things I would say to improve their answers to make sure they're getting the best possible results. So hopefully you'll be able to take my comments and criticisms away. I apologise if I come across as being a little bit too harsh, maybe I am, but as I said, have a look at the examiner's notes as well. It will also help to put my comments into context. Uh, so without any more waffle, let's get stuck straight into it. So the first thing we're going to have a look at is the FC video with Kokui and Chris. So let's get started. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jill Budgie and this is my colleague Ros Smith. Hi. And your names are? My name is Kokui. Mm -hmm. Chris. And can I have your mark sheets, please? Thank you. So at the beginning of the exam, you have to go through the formalities, but I always say this is an important part of the exam because it's the first time that your examiner will get to know a little bit about you in terms of your ability to speak and what the challenges they might have and indeed what what type of English the examiner thinks you might be capable of. You've got to remember the human element as well. So if the examiner says hello or good morning, then respond in kind. Say hello or good morning. You're humans after all. This is what humans do. What's your na name? Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, I'm Kokui. Be brave and bold about it. Uh, 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 introduce yourselves appropriately and then when, she, uh, when the examiner says can I have your mark sheets say something like yes of course here you go something like this now you might think oh, I'm being a little bit silly and perhaps I am but there's psychology at play the examiners will be working for hours and hours and hours and hours and the examiners have lots and lots of experience and if those first few words that normal interaction doesn't get off to a good start, the examiner is already thinking, oh my god, or the examiner might be thinking, okay, this is going to be good. So there's that psychological impact as well, so it's important. Say good morning, say hello, introduce yourself, be brave, confident, get the English flowing, clear your throat, and get ready for part one. Where are you from, Kokui? Um, I'm from Malaysia. And you? And I'm from China. You're going to get the question, where are you from? More than likely, you're going to get the question, where are you from? And even though you've only got a few seconds to talk, you should be using that to communicate as much information as possible. Not just, I'm from Poland, or I'm from Germany, but I'm from Warsaw, which is the capital city of Poland. Um, I'm from, uh, I don't know, I'm from Hamburg, which is on the coast of the northern coast of Germany. I'm from where, where, wherever, and give me some geographical marker something about the city. You can communicate that information in 10 to 15 words, which is pretty much all the time you have, but straight away you're showing off to the examiner what you're capable of, and you're beginning to win and influence the, uh, the examiner on that psychological level. 
First, we'd like to know something about you. Um, Chris, who do you spend time with after school? Um, I spend time with my roommates, where I cook together and do homework together. So who do you spend time with after school? And the answer was quite good in as far as he answered the question and then he, um, Chris naturally offered a follow up. So I spend time with these people and I do this. Although there is so much more that you can say. Two sentences, really you should be going, you should be speaking until the examiner stops you. Timing yourself to answer a question and speak for 30 seconds to one minute. Just keep on going, sentence after sentence. What are you doing? What do you do? Do you enjoy this? Do you not enjoy this? Does it depend on the day? La, 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 la. Think of something. Don't just offer two sentences and then let the other person speak. Go and go and go until the examiner tells you to stop talking. Okay, and uh, Kokui, tell us about a good teacher you've had. Um, my good teacher, um, my econo economics teacher, his name is Darren. I like him because he gave us a lot of note, a lot of notes every single lesson. So I find it very useful for mm. my for the acute education or something. Mm. Mm. So once again, it was a good answer in as far as he answered the question and then offered a follow up. But that follow up could have been so much more. One thing he does do here, which I'm not too happy with, is that he just ends it saying or something. What does that mean, or something? Does that mean that the examiner automatically fills in all of the gaps and then creates a wonderful answer in her head? Or does it mean that you don't really know what to say and that you just kind of end it in an awkward way? Don't say, or something, or whatever, or anything like this. It's a bad way to end the sentence. And um, Chris, do you enjoy using the internet in your free time? Yes, I always <coughs> do online shopping. Or such TV shows online. Yeah, it's quite useful because I can get everything I want from the internet. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy using the internet in your free time? That is a half an hour topic of conversation. You can go, you can talk the hind legs of a donkey with a question like that. So there is no excuse for just a three second answer, a three uh, sentence answer to a question like that. You go and go and go and go and go until the examiner says, I've had enough, stop talking. So even though the answer was okay, I would still say there's much more that you can do, say, uh, a much better way that you can prepare and you should be flying into those questions to show off your skills. And um Kokui, where would you like to go for your next holiday? Mm, maybe Japan, because during the winter season, because I like snow a lot, mm, I might go to there to ski or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Do you enjoy reading? Yeah, I've started to read like three years ago. I like fiction books a lot. I read about them every night mm -hmm. and recently I just started a book called Clockwork Angels. Yeah. Okay. So he asked two questions there about uh, holidays which he answers very very shortly and then finishes with whatever which is a terrible way to finish off a sentence and then the examiner in an, probably in an act of mercy gives him another question to try and get some more English out of him about a book and he answers that question a little bit better but even so these are questions that you should just be talking and talking and talking of course making sense but talking and talking until the examiner says stop which is what you've got to practice. Okay, so that's part one for the FCE over, so let's have a look at part one for the CAE and see how well they get on. Good morning. Hi. My name is Bridget Harrison and this is my colleague Mary Whiteside. And your names are? Raphael. Raphael. Lord. Lord. Can I have your mark sheets, please? Thank you. So there was that awkward interaction. The examiner says good morning and both of them go mm -hmm. It's um, 
good morning is, is answered with good morning. Good afternoon is answered with good afternoon. Hello is answered with hello. Be brave, be bold, and introduce that human interaction. Uh, what's your names? Um, and they off, both offered one word answers, which was their names. But there's nothing wrong with you saying, hi, my name is dot, 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 dot. And just throwing those extra few words gives you a few seconds just to show off a little bit more of your English. And then, of course, uh, as you hand over the answer as the question answer papers, sorry, uh, then you should say, of course, here you go, something like that. So just to introduce that natural human element. First of all, we'd like to know something about you. Raphael, where are you from? I'm from Lucerne. It's a city in Switzerland and it's in the German part. And what do you do there? I'm still at school and have two years to go. So where are you from? The answer is a little bit more developed, as you would expect from CAE, but there's still plenty more room there. And then the question about school was answered too quickly. Just think about the possibilities that you could say, what you do at school, what you enjoy teaching, what are you working on at the moment, and etc, etc. You've got to fill up that time. If you don't fill up that time, and if the examiner doesn't tell you to stop talking, then you're not showing off your talents. You're not using the full time available to you to score as many marks as possible. Maud, how long have you been studying English? Well, um, I think I've been studying English for about six years now, yes. So, so the answer, the question, granted, there's not much that you can say about that. How long have you been learning English? And she answers it in a pretty natural way. So I'll give her kudos for that. What do you enjoy most about learning English? It's, um, it is very useful, I mean, to talk with foreigners. I have a lot of foreigners. For, um, foreign friends and I really enjoy being able to talk with them. Could have been more in that answer. There could have been more. There could have been more information. The good thing was is that she almost got into a little bit of difficulty with foreigners but she managed to work through it. She didn't lose her cool but she only gave us one positive for speaking English. I'd like to think that there are at least five or ten positives and she could have gone through those explaining the benefits of speaking English. So once again, with a little bit more practice, with a little bit more awareness, uh, and which you only get through practice in, uh, in a pressured situation, could have had a lot more of an answer out of there. Maud, do you think you spend too much time working or studying? <laughs> well, sometimes, maybe because I'm hard working, I like it. And sometimes I think I should rest, <laughs> take time to rest, yes. Why? Mm, because, well, I when I study, I stayed at home. I didn't go out with friends or I didn't like working at a cafe or something. Mm -hmm. So it's not very a social activity. <laughs> So in her answer, which is, it seems to be a fairly natural English, I mean, she's evidently got skills at advanced level, it comes across very, very well. But one thing that the examiner should never have to ask is why? Because you should be answering that question already. You should be giving reasons, explanations, expanding the topic and so on. So the question was asked because the uh, the student was coming to a natural end of the sentence. My I would suggest that you just you avoid the question why by just preempting it and giving as much information as you possibly can. Raphael, do you like using the internet to keep in touch with people? Yeah, sometimes. But to keep in touch with people, I think it's better to see them face to face, not just writing. So, but. Like something like Facebook, I think it's useful, like a contact book, but not really as interaction between people. This is a good answer, and whenever, and I think uh, the girl beforehand did this to a certain extent as well, if you can find the contrast and comparison, if you can find the discussion in a simple answer, then that's where you can start talking and talking and talking. And as you can see, the examiner doesn't answer, ask sorry, a follow-up question. The examiner doesn't say why or tell me more. The, the guy there goes into quite a deal of detail, quite a good discussion, and evidently the examiner's happy with what she's heard. 
Okay, so let's get into the part one questions. Uh, and first of all, let's have a look at the FCE. Okay, before we listen to the answers, let's analyze the questions by ourselves. So this is the first question for the part one. And the question is, what might be difficult for the people about trying to win in these situations? Now, if you remember with part one, we do not want a description of activities. We do not want it. It's a waste of time. You're not getting marked on being able to describe. So talking, telling the examiner what's happening in the photograph is not going to win you any points. It's just going to waste, just going to waste time. The examiner has got eyes. The examiner can see there is a tennis match in the first, um, picture that there is some kind of race in the second picture you don't have to go into any great detail but what we do have to do is apply that info that picture to the question and the question is what might be difficult for the people about trying to win in these situations so the situation in a tennis match first of all the competitors might be professional judging by the photograph they are because there's a huge stadium with lots of people involved so if you've got if you've got a crowd that means you've got atmosphere how does that affect you does it affect you positively does it affect you negatively uh, the level of professionalism. Are you an experienced professional? Are you a good professional? Or are you a novice professional at the beginning of your career? As regards uh, racing, um, the situation seems to be a lot less pressure. There certainly doesn't seem to be a crowd. It looks as if it might be taking part in a school field of some kind or in a park. So there's just a different level of pressure. The people in the photograph appear to be young, so there's a different level of professionalism or experience. And um, how would that affect the people in that race in terms of trying to win? Tennis is one on one, racing is one on many. So how does that, or does that have any impact on how easy, uh, how easy or difficult it is to try to win in those situations? So very, very quickly, we've brainstormed all of the, of the two photographs in relation to the question to come up with six or seven different points that we can say and we can apply in, to the, uh, in the correct context. So let's find out how our person did. Um, the first picture, it's a tennis tournament. It's, it's a competition between two persons and they play against each other. For the second picture, it's either marathon or running. It's, they have like a certain amount of people participated together to run. And for, as for the question, what might be difficult for this for the people about about trying to win in this situation? Um, For the first picture, I think the opponent, like the level of skills of their opponents is very important. And for the second picture, all you need is training and perseverance and, and run until the end of the finish line. Thank you. So he wastes well over 30 seconds doing what he's not meant to be doing. In other words, describing the pictures. Now, he might feel comfortable describing the pictures, but for me, this is, a, this is a perfect illustration of someone who's not prepared, ideally, for the speaking exam, because they should know straight away there's no point in describing, there's no point wasting 30 seconds, and you should be able to practice your brainstorming skills as regards uh, a question to come up with three or four ideas very, very quickly. And it takes time, it takes practice to do that, and it's not easy, which is why you have to practice this. And if you did practice it, then um, you would be able to get to the answers or what the examiner wants to hear a lot faster. And I think um, that uh, Kokui started to give us an answer uh, of some kind uh, around about 30 to 40 seconds into the minute or so that he has, which is not really the best possible result. So I would say that it's not so fantastic, this answer, although I would strongly recommend that you have a look at the examiner's comments for this as well because I think they differ slightly to what I've just said. Maybe I've been a little bit too harsh but not too happy with that. Let's go over to the CAE and see how well they do. Okay so CAE slightly different rules. You're given three pictures you have to talk about two. 
If you talk about three, it just shows that you're not listening to the instructions. It doesn't mean that you're going to score any bonus points. It just means that you're not listening or you're breaking the rules. No positives to be had there. So I'm going to select the uh, the people who are on a, some kind of ski trek and the people playing the guitar. Now, I'm not going to uh, identify them. Well, maybe I can identify them now, obviously. You can say, okay, so this picture and this picture, or the, the ski trekkers and the guitar players, very, very quickly, a few seconds. Why might these people doing these uh, these things together? Very, very quickly. Uh, ski trekkers, they need each other's support. Different people have different roles. Um, they're going a long way. Um, mental, um, being able to deal with the mental challenges of skiing, uh, um, and so on, so on. So already I've given you three or four there. Uh, the guitarists, having fun, getting improving their skills together, forming a band, uh, in experimenting with music, uh, Certainly it appears to be a kind of fairly calm atmosphere if you look at their faces. So already there's four or five things there to explain why these people are doing these things. So how might they be feeling? And this is the part of the question where you can go into a little bit more depth. They must, the ski trek will think of the things they must be feeling excited, nervous. Um, they must be wary of the challenges ahead of them. Uh, they must be stressed out because of the pressure. How far are they going to go? Do they have the right equipment? Do they have communications with the guitarist? Uh, let's say they must be feeling um, relaxed, happy, they don't seem to be under any pressure, they're doing things for fun, re uh, relaxing, enjoyment, um, as this is, they're not thinking of school or the other pressurized things that they have, so that's how they might be feeling. And then compare them together, compare those feelings together and see if there are any comparisons and if there's any uh, differences between them. So lack of pressure in with the guitarists compared to a lot of pressure into life or death pressure with the skiers um, in terms of similarities it talks about teamwork as a band you have to work together as a team and as an expedition you have to work together as a team and so on so on so on so that's what you should be thinking straight away and being able to formulate those ideas or at least my ideas of course you can have completely different ideas and i'm not saying that my ideas are correct ideas these are just some ideas so these are the kind of things that you might be thinking about. So let's see how well our person does. So um, I think these two guys are playing just music together. And the, these three little girls are baking, I don't know, a cake or something. And I think um, they are doing it together because they might be sisters because they look so similar. and. These two are maybe in a band or in a music group, and I think they enjoy to play together music and interact with, together. And the, uh, these three girls just like to um, have fun here and bake in the kitchen. I don't think it will be a nice cake, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just to learn how to cook. And it's just an activity for them together. and. I think the, the both guys could also be preparing for something, maybe a concert or something. But yeah, they're just Thank playing. you, Rafael. So he does a couple of good things there. Um, the answers are generally okay. They could be formulated a little bit better, particularly with emphasis on language of similarity and comparison in terms of bringing them all together. Uh, he identifies the pictures very quickly at the beginning without going into any great descriptions of what's going on, which is also very good. And he talks for the whole minute until he stopped. So this is a, not a bad answer. But as I said, have a look at the examiner's comments um, in the video description below the original video and see what the examiner says. I would say that there's still work to be done, but on uh, on the face of it, not too bad. Going back to the FCE question, uh, let's have a look at the follow-up question. Chris, which sport would you prefer to do? Well, I prefer tennis, but it's more fun, I think, because I can run lots in the ground and it really makes me feel relaxed and but I can't do it in the short time because I've just twisted my ankle while playing tennis. So 
the question is, um, do you prefer? And that's a, a fairly standard um, follow-up question. So get ready to answer with answer. Do you prefer questions with the appropriate structure? So I prefer this because la 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 la. Uh, his answer was, um, or Chris's answer was a, a was an answer of two parts. The first part was a bit nonsensical, really, and it was kind of intermediate vocabulary, and I don't know what was going on there. And then the second part, where he was talking about twisting his ankle and the fact that he can't do tennis, suddenly we've he's showing off his English skills and the naturalness of his English and his ability to speak English. So it's kind of a half and half. The first half was kind of not so great, and then the second half was just, look at what I can do. And the examiner must be thinking... I can see you've got skills, give me more or a little be more consistent or show me show me what you can do. So there's probably a little bit of frustration from the point of view of the examiner. Let's have a look at the CAE. Maud, <clears throat> in which situation do you think the people benefit most from being together? Well, in, I think every kind of situation depends uh, on the kind of relationship you have with the person. Um, when you're at school, maybe in a class, uh, it's good to talk with some people sometimes just to think about something else. And when you're cooking, the same, you share uh, ideas, you learn things. When you're play playing music, you, well, you learn about each other. So it really depends on the situation. Thank you. Now the follow-up question for the CAE is a lot more involved than the simple question that you would get for the FCE, but she answers it really, really well. She goes through a discussion of all of the pictures, she talks about the uh, something from each picture, she talks about relationships, there's wonderful vocabulary, she's clued, she's turned on, she's aware, she's paying attention. So this is all, it all adds to a fantastic answer, so here she does really, really well. Okay, I would encourage you to have a look at the other person's answers. We didn't go through them in this video, and I'd like you to do what we did in this video. So pause the video, have a look at the question, think about how you would answer it, and then listen to what was said and critique it. Was it good? Was it bad? Where could it have gone better? Where did it go wrong? If it went wrong, why did it go wrong? And how could we stop that from happening? And make that part of your personal development for part one uh, and part two of the speaking exam. So I hope you managed to get something out of the video today. If you got any questions at all, comments if you think I was too harsh, if you uh, want my point of view on anything else as regards to these videos, then leave a comment in the comment section below and I will get back to you. Next week we're going to have a look at part three of the speaking exam in much the same way that we've had a look at part one and part one, part two today. So I'll see you again uh, on Monday with another writing exercise and on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with all of the other parts of the uh, Cambridge exams and on Friday again where we have a look at part three of the speaking exam. Have a great weekend and I'll see you again soon.